Guys, what'd you think of the first week? Give me some, communicate with thumbs up, thumbs down. What'd you think of the, the actual material? Yeah? Oh, clapping. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down? Anyone intimidated by day one? Did you find that to be longer and a little bit harder? Yeah. I was like, oh boy, they're going to hate me. <laughs> this just took an hour. Yeah, but it was good. It was good to get started. I uh, hope you enjoyed your table discussion. Um, we enjoyed digging in on Sunday. The only bummer about Sunday study, um, I was worried, you know, about the tables and people being mean girls. I was worried about the chaos of, like, switching this room over. None of that was a problem. But the problem was is that we all heard a bird in here, and we were all on edge. And I am, like, going around here looking. This thing is, like, hiding. I am, like, picturing it dive-bombing me while I start teaching. And then we realized that it was from the microphone, and there was no bird. It was, it was because I had this on while a handheld was on. I, technology stuff, is sound stuff, music stuff, it just stresses me out. So there was no bird, so that was good. That would have made a memory, but yeah. Um, before we get started, any logistical questions that you have that you think other people might also have that would add some clarity? One thing schedule-wise is that I don't know when everyone's spring break is, but we are not taking a week off for that. Um, we got to think about childcare because I don't know where if our babysitters all go home and stuff like that. But we have tried both. We've tried taking a week off. We've tried doing something different on spring break. We're just we're just gonna go right through it. And those of us who don't have a spring break trip can hang out together. <laughs> so if you're looking ahead, um, okay. No questions as we get started? All right, well, let's, let's jump in then to kind of our, our first week of going deep into the second half of Exodus. Um, so as we started, uh, kind of repeating the, the verses that we focused on last week, what we're jumping into, guys, is another creation story, right? So Exodus comes right after Genesis when we think creation story. We think God creating the heavens and the earth. It's a familiar story for us, but we actually should be kind of cued in at Exodus 19 that this also is a creation story, but now it's the creation of God's children. This is the creation story for the nation of Israel. So we see right away Mount Horeb. Our first question on day two was helping us connect what happened at Mount Horeb and what happened at Mount Sinai. And guys, I want us to put our, ourselves in Moses' shoes. As he is approaching Mount Sinai, leading this multitude of people, what is he remembering? He is walking the same path that he walked so long before when he was at Mount Horeb, the same mountain where he experienced the same God, where he heard promises that were now being fulfilled. Think of the memories that were coming to him where he saw a burning bush, where he was told, take off your shoes. Why? Because it's holy ground. And now here he is at Sinai, and he's going to hear some of the same revelations of God, same mountain, same God, as our story begins. And what's so interesting, guys, is picture them setting up camp here. As our study opens, picture them setting up camp, but it's not just for a day or two. It's not a quick weekend of camping. They'll actually be at the base of Mount Sinai for up to a year, which kind of changes how we look at this story. So as we talked about last week, guys, God is going to begin the conversation with his people by talking about identity. So in the verses that we looked at last week, um, we saw that God is going to remind them of where they came from. He's going to remind them of their purpose. And he's going to speak to them about their identity. We read about, you are going to be my possession. You are going to be a kingdom of priests. You are going to be a holy nation. And so I say identity, and we all think, yes, we love to talk about identity, right? Like, that's a natural thing to be excited about. Like, oh, this is like pre-Enneagram. Way to go, Moses. Like, let's talk about it. But what I want us to look at and what a couple of the questions in our homework looked at is let's slow down and see what those three uh, definitions or descriptions, what did they reveal first and foremost about God? Remember, we say this often that the knowledge of self comes after the knowledge of God. 
That's why when we open our Bible, we're looking for truths about God before we look for truths about ourselves. And we won't be left wanting. We will see so much about ourselves. But let's look at these three descriptions. What do they tell us about God? The question that is being answered for the people in this original, or the people in Moses's, under Moses' leadership is, who exactly is this God that's going to be in covenant with us? Who, who is this God? Who is Yahweh that wants to be in covenant with us? So it's like he's saying to the nation of Israel, okay, you've been delivered, you've come through the waters, you've watched your enemies be annihilated, but let's be clear about this. You are my possession, not the possessor of whatever you want. We, we had to make that distinction. And part of why I want to start on this, guys, is when I, when I saw those questions on day two, I, I was like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to get out of this. And it took multiple rounds of kind of going and just sitting and staring at the question marks in my workbook. Like, wh what are we really supposed to get here? Um, and so what I see here, and she helped us see this distinction, is you'll be my possession, not the possessor of whatever you want. You will be carried, right? He's talked about being carried like on the wings of an eagle, not the carrier of things. And then I remember, do you remember what they did as they left Egypt? They plundered them. Their arms were quite literally full of things, full of treasures and riches and goods and supplies. And so here they are, and God is making a pretty important distinction that I am the one doing the carrying. I am carrying you, like on the wings of an eagle. Secondly, he talked about you will be a kingdom of priests. Okay, what, what are we supposed to get from that? A kingdom, this sounds oversimplified, but I went right past it. A kingdom implies that there's a king. And if you're in the kingdom, that means you're not the king. A kingdom of priests, there's a king, you're not it, you're the priest. Making a, a differentiation between God's role and their role. He's the king. They are the servants. They're the royal servants, lest they get confused about what it meant to be a slave under Pharaoh and a servant under God. I rule, you serve. And third, he talks about them being a holy nation. We answered the question, what's the difference between, between a great nation and a holy nation? And guys, this is one of those opportunities where it's good if the Bible just keeps creating more questions in our mind. Because in our table in the back, we said, wait a second. There was a guy who came before Moses named Abraham. And wasn't he given the promise that he would be a great nation? Now we have another covenant that's not, not canceling out that covenant, but kind of opening it up. And they're related, but we're reading that they're a holy nation. And it should just make us curious. What does that teach us about God? That he's holy. His people, his kingdom, his priests need to resemble him, reflect him, represent him. And so they need to be holy, which is not the way that the world defines greatness. So why was this important? Why, why is this like the preamble to the covenant? Because... If they were to live out their purpose, this is where it actually gets into identity. If they're going to live out their purpose, then they needed to bear God's image to the world. They were going to be the means of blessing to the whole world. And so they had to look like, sound like God. So the application started to kind of open up to me still on these three descriptions because I thought about like, do we intuitively know this? Do, I, I think so. Do we intuitively know that we're not made to be the carrier of all of the toys, riches, wealth, inheritance? That we were made to be a priesthood? That we were made to be holy? We know that this is what makes society go round because we know where we don't see this. Think of the three-year-old classroom and Veritas kids on a Sunday morning. We see exactly this. They didn't answer, they don't, wouldn't answer these questions correctly. They think of an alpha female in the three-year-old classroom. What is she doing? 
What are her and all her little competitors doing? They're carrying everything they can, right? Every toy is supposed to be theirs. So they're not happy with just one, but they, they're not just happy with one in each, but they're piling them up and you see them trying to protect their treasures from everybody else, trying to possess everything. They're not interested in serving their little co-heir three-year-olds. They see them all as competition, right? And they're not looking to be holy, no matter how good our curriculum is, they want to be great, right? And we laugh and we think, oh, isn't that cute? I'm glad I don't serve in that classroom. <laughs> but guys, that does not age well. It's cute in a three-year-old. Who is it not cute in? A 38-year-old, right? But does the principle still apply? Is that little alpha three-year-old still inside of us sometimes. Don't we just want to be the carrier of our things? Don't we want to control and possess things that make us feel safe and in control and better than other people? Don't we, like we talked about last week so often, want to be the queen in the queendom, not the servant, not the priest? And don't we so often, rather than being holy, we just want to be great in multiple different ways of defining great. And then it hit me at a whole nother level, guys, of where this actually convicted me of sin is when I picture myself, especially wanting to be the possessor of riches, when I'm holding on to things, so if it's my job or it's my money or it's my kids or if it's my whatever, when I'm holding on to things, I am not surrendered. My grip is tight and stressed. It's not surrendered. God's identity for us is to be carried, to be his possession, to serve in his kingdom, to be holy. Holy over greatness. Guys, obedience over fame, obedience over comfort, purity over greatness. I think these opening verses really confront our very natural desires. But there's something else I see here about identity. Uh, just, just for a quick moment, I want to talk about this. I like that God spoke this identity that's tethered to his character right away in their early, the early parts of their creation story. It came to them, this identity stuff came to them before the law, right? We saw where the law was given this week, the Ten Commandments. But identity, purpose, came before the law. Identity before commands. Identity before it was realized. And then I think that it's all over the Bible, actually, this is actually what a good and gracious God does. Think of Abram getting a name change and becoming Abraham, the father of many nations, while he was still childless. Guys, it's mercy and it's grace, but we're in the Old Testament. Mercy and grace are not reserved for the second half of our Bibles, but right away, right here, we see God's heart for his children, that he is speaking this gracious purpose over them. And he would continue to do it as the Bible story continues. Peter, Simon had his name changed to Peter before he proved that he could be the rock on which the church was built. But we even see it spoken to kind of the church at large. Remember in Matthew how the people are told, you are a city on a hill. You are the salt of the earth. It's speaking purpose and promise over them long before they prove that they can do it, or if they were to ever prove that they can do it. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. So here we are in our story. Moses passes on the commands of God. He passes on the words of God to this young nation of Israel, and they say, we'll do it. They're excited. They're believing that they can do it. They promise to keep the covenant. And so God goes to them, and he says, okay, you've got three days to prepare for for a theophany. Here's a fancy word for a week, our theophany. He was going to reveal himself to the people. He was going to come down on the mountain. God says, I want you to prepare. I want you to be consecrated for my coming down. Again, this is a continuation of the, the first point. They need to know 
who God is. And so he graciously reveals himself. So they are supposed to wash their clothing, not touch the mountain, and don't touch a woman. What are they supposed to learn from these? What are they supposed to learn about God? That he's holy. This idea of holiness is important for us to understand. It means so much more than just moral purity. It's more than just that God is pure. It's that God is separate. God is unique. And rather than us just, you know, looking this up in a dictionary or whatever, I think we see it in the story. And when I learn something from a story, it sticks with me so much more than just looking up a definition. Did you notice that Moses, Moses' ascension and descension on the mountain was repeated several times in our text. Moses went up the mountain, Moses came down. Moses went up, Moses went down. I think this week we read it three times, but in 19 through 40, I want to see if you guys can guess this. What, how many times do you think that it's mentioned? Hint, hint, what number did we hear in the sermon on Sunday morning? Seven. Seven times. Moses, you guys all knew that. You're just being humble. You're just keeping the answer to yourself. Seven times Moses was described as going up and down the mountain. That's interesting repetition. Why do we care? Well, first of all, it pulls us into the skin of the story. We need to actually picture old man Moses making this hike up and down the mountain. This wasn't a 10-minute hike. I need you to think about what his body was being asked to do, the time that was given to this, and what are you, what are you picking up on? The fit, I, I think this was really helpful. I found this in a commentary. What this does all seven times is it is a vivid portrayal of the distance between the people and God. Is that helpful? Let me say that again. This is what we're supposed to pick up on this. This is how we understand holiness from the story. It was a vivid portrayal of the distance between the people and God. What is God revealing about himself? That he is unlike man. Moses, the narrator, is displaying how very different we are from God. And so God comes down on the mountain, and what happens? It's a pretty intense scene, right? We hear thunder, lightning, a thick cloud, a loud trumpet blast. We read that it was wrapped in smoke and that there was even an earthquake at the base of the mountain. The people, the young children, are learning how to fear God. So let's talk about this as a large group for a second. What does it mean to fear God? Think about it for just a second. When you read this story this week, did you think, oh, that's good. They needed to experience that. When you read that they didn't come near the mountain and actually even that they just wanted Moses to go for them. Did you think, yeah, that's good. Or did you think, oh, that's sad. I think we need to Think about our natural reaction, and then think about this phrase, to fear God. We're instructed to do it. We're instructed to be God-fearing women. And there was a day in our homework this week where we went through, goodness, a lot of verses that showed us the benefit of being a God-fearing woman, the good fruit that comes from that. So I want to hear from you guys, and I learned from Sunday that this is probably the, the better question. Think of a woman that you would describe as such. Oh, she is a God-fearing woman. What is it about her that makes you say that? And I actually, I want you guys to shout it out and I'll repeat it so that everyone hears it. What's, what is it specifically about that woman, the way she lives, the way she holds herself, that makes her a God-fearing woman in your mind? Does the right thing. Yeah. Great practical answer. She does the right thing. She's righteous. Conscious, like aware. Yeah, self-aware. Yeah, that's good. Humble. Yeah. Okay, a woman who fears the Lord is humble. So the opposite of humble would be proud or arrogant. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I wanted to kind of tease this out. That's good. Humble doesn't necessarily mean cowering in the corner, hiding from God. 
right? But confident, yeah. Seeks after God. Mm -hmm. Energy putting towards, like, pursuing God. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this one. Say it again. Letting the Lord be in control rather than taking control. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let's just land here and, and talk about this one. How does fearing the Lord and our desire for control interact? When I am, okay, when I want to take control, it's usually because I'm afraid of something. Do you agree? We're afraid of, of something that, that might come. And so our reaction to that fear is to control it. What if instead of, what can we replace fear of circumstance, fear of person? What can we replace that with? Fear of, yeah, fear of God and trust in God. When we fear the Lord, it weakens all other fears. When we fear, when we revere the Lord as holy, as separate, it's crazy what happens to the lesser fears. So I set my aim, even if I don't fully know an exhaustive answer of what it means to fear him appropriately, but I set my aim on him and his holiness. And then my fear of sickness, it weakens. My fear of criticism weakens. My fear of an unknown future, of loss, it all weakens. We set our eyes and our gaze on worship on the Lord as we begin and continue the process of becoming a woman who fears the Lord. Awesome. Thanks for talking through that with me, guys. Okay, so back in our story. Now, I want to just make one little, um, like, study cue that I was so confused. This part of Exodus that we read this week, it's not necessarily linear, like, chronologically, right? So it's like we're reading about the consecration. We're reading about the theophany when God reveals himself. But then it jumps to the Ten Commandments. But if you got a little lost, it's kind of confusing because... Like, Moses is given the Ten Commandments by God on top of the mountain, but it's not until chapters later that he actually comes down and gives it to the people. So it's almost like we're getting a little look behind the curtain of this is what happened up on the mountain. And we actually, I meant to look it up, but we're at least going to do three weeks, the next three weeks on the Ten Commandments, I believe, and we're going to go through much slower. Um, so for this morning, I just wanted to hit on a couple things that I think are good warm-ups for the Ten Commandments. Um, so he delivers the 10 words to the people, to the liberated people. And these 10 commandments, we're probably more familiar with these than, um, than other areas of the Old Testament. Uh, what they were, they were a moral code. It wasn't like this brand new novel idea um, that no one had ever been given a moral code before. Actually, it fit into the context of these ancient people. People had received moral codes before. But these were actually inspired. They came right from God. And I didn't get this myself, but I love this, guys. So you see how God is delivering 10 words of life to them after they had just experienced 10 plagues of death. Isn't that sweet redemption? 10 plagues of death that led to their deliverance, but then they are gifted 10 words of life, 10 words that will show them how to live as God's people. And we saw how they, how they kind of break down. The first four are about how to have a right relationship with God. The next six are about how to have right relationships with one another. And I love that this kind of clarifies or adds to what we talked about last week, that Christianity or following the Lord does not, uh, does not put law and relationship apart from each other. Christianity is not just about relationship, although it is very much about it, but it is also about rules. We don't need to erase the first half of our Bible to be okay with the message of Jesus. Because we see that actually it's the rules that teach us how to have relationships. The rules inform our relationships. They teach us how to behave. 
And seeing first that the, the first four are about our relationship with God, doesn't that show us that when we are right with God, it's going to be a lot easier to be right with one another, right? It's going to be a lot easier when we're right here, when we don't have idols before him, when we're not making an image, when we are holding his name as holy. It's going to be a lot easier for us to love each other. It's going to be a lot easier for us to honor the people in our homes or the people that we take care of. Okay, so now we see that the people's reaction changes. Remember, what did they say? We're going to do it. We're going to obey the covenant. And then everything goes dark and scary and loud and shaking. And they say, eh, never mind. In fact, what do they say? We're going to die. They're changing their tune. They're not so excited anymore. They say, no, 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 we're going to die. Moses, you go for us. Go ahead for us, Moses or else we will die. So it's great. They're, they seem to be learning about his holiness, but then they're told to stay away, not even come close to the base of the mountain to stand far off. It's great. They seem to be understanding there's a difference between them and God. But now they're so far away from him. What happened to this God who carried them like an eagle? What happened to that intimacy? Is it gone now? Did something change Again, we're not looking to tie a bow on this, but to just become curious students of the word. They ask Moses to be the mediator. They say, we will keep the covenant, but Moses, we need you. But, but we will do it. We will keep the law. But do they? No. They don't end up keeping the law, not the Ten Commandments or the 600 plus laws that follow the Ten Commandments. What ends up happening, guys, is that this treasured possession of God ends up acting so often like orphans. They so often act like they don't have a father who wants to care for them or provide for them, carry them. They will often fail to act like a kingdom, a priest. They don't want to serve. They don't want to be set apart. And so you know what happens? They end up needing priests themselves. They need priests to go and mediate between them and God, to be the go-between. And they will so often neglect holiness and instead just try to be great. And what ends up happening is that they're neither. They don't end up being holy or great. And guys, here's where that big story of the Bible starts rolling in our mind. Here's the big story. Here's where Exodus plays out. They will continue to need mediators after Moses. It's not like they just asked Moses, hey, can you do this? And then when he dies, it's all better. No, they continue to need someone to go to them, to go to God on their behalf. Mediators, priests, Judges, we're kind of walking through the story of the Bible right now. Mediators, priests, judges, kings, prophets. People who would deliver God's message, people who would take the people's message up to God. They would need a go between. And as the centuries pass, they break the covenant and they become hardened to the God who delivered them. Sometimes the mediators would bring warning. Often they would, right? And this is that chapter in our Bible or the, the chunk in our Bible that I think we are probably most unfamiliar with. This is like, you know, it gets real confusing after David and before baby Jesus. We're like, I, I don't know what happens here, right? This is often where we find, these are the, the Ezekiels, the Jeremiah's, the Hosea's and Habakkuk's and help me out, Zacharias, there's a lot of them, right? And it gets really confusing. But what we need to know about that time is that these people are raised up to be go-betweens between God and his children. And often they're bringing warnings and cautions. And they're saying, you need to change. You need to obey the law. You need to remember your deliverance or else punishment is coming. But sometimes these prophets like Isaiah would bring good news. 
they would bring a message of hope, something like a shot in the arm to keep the people going. And Isaiah has this beautiful uh, prophecy, this almost like baiting them to look forward to something good that's coming. This is in Isaiah 2, verse 3. It says, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Okay, put yourself there. You're the rebellious children of Israel. You have very little hope. You feel like you've messed up too much for too long. And yet you hear this promise passed on from Isaiah. You've got Israel's history in the past. You've got Sinai in your past. And you hear this verse. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Why? That he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Like, oh, obedience is possible? Like, things are going to turn around? We're going to be able to obey the law someday? Will you guys grab your Bibles and open, not to Exodus, but to Matthew, or open your phone app. We're going to take a second. I want you to open to Matthew chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And then after that you see... Blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are. You see the Sermon on the Mount. I want to give you a second. Not for table time, but just look at these verses. And I just want you, you can write them down or you can just look at it. What do you observe from these verses that maybe sounds a little bit like what we studied this week? A good Bible study tool is just making observations. If you, if you want another hint of where to start, think back to like junior high English class. What um, nouns do you see? What verbs do you see? What people, place, things? When I read that Isaiah verse, what we're reading in a moment like that is a messianic prophecy. We, what it is when we land on a verse like Isaiah, it's this really important, pivotal moment in the Bible where we're kind of like thrust forward in hope to, to get excited about something that was coming for that original audience, something that would change, that would be a, an incredibly important moment in the Bible's story. So we go from Isaiah to Matthew. And what do we see, guys? We see that Jesus is now here. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And he sees the crowds and we realize, oh, we've been talking about a crowd all morning. And where did he go? Up on a mountain. And he sits down. And do we hear Sinai replaying? Are we seeing the similarities but then we stop, we say, he sits down. And maybe at first what we realize is, oh, that's awesome. That's because the Old Testament, like the angry, grouchy God, isn't part of the New Testament. Maybe we think, oh, good, grouchy God is over, and now it's nice, comfy Jesus. No. But we are encouraged that he sits down because we think, oh, God has come. He is in human skin. He is accessible to the people. But maybe there's even something more there, and I think there is. Because actually we see it's the same kind of location on a hillside, on a mountainside. We see that it's the same God, but we are also invited to see that it's the same king. Matthew depicts Jesus as sitting down to show us that he is the king of the Jews, that he is the king of kings. Lest we kind of over uh, swing and put him in this just super comfy, soft, pacifist Jesus. No, 
He's sitting on this hillside as the king, sitting on a throne, enthroned between the cherubim. Over and over in the Old Testament, kings are depicted as sitting and holding authority. And Jesus comes and he is bringing the law. He's bringing the Sermon on the Mount, guys. What he is saying to the crowds is, this is how you live in the kingdom of God. These are the words of life. This is how you can be blessed. See, he's taking the same law from Moses and he's kind of bringing it to life. Instead of showing them how to follow the letter of the law, like the Pharisees were doing, the spiritual leaders, he's gonna show them how to live out the spirit of the law. He's going to show them the heart of the law. See, we are seeing Jesus as God's beloved son. We are seeing him as the king bringing his kingdom in this moment, and we see him as the perfect priest. He's going to be what Israel failed to be, not once, not twice, but three times. He's the perfect go-between, between between God and his sinful people that he loves. But what's different about Matthew from Exodus is that the people didn't have to stay far off. They were invited to draw near the disciples and then the crowds were invited to draw near to Jesus. And guys, I love this. There's actually so many times in the Bible when Jesus goes up on a mountain or up on a hillside. Over and over again, we see him. Think of the transfiguration. That was on a mountaintop. When he gives the great commission and when he ascends to heaven, he's on the Mount of Olives. It's a fun theme to look throughout the Bible for. And every time he is up on one of these mountains, guys, he is revealing his authority. But there's one time that maybe we don't see it as clearly. One time that he goes up on a mountain, when he goes up on a hill, the hill of Golgotha. This time as he goes up the mountain, he has a cross on his back. And his authority, his glory, it's kind of shrouded in mystery. Kind of like how Sinai was shrouded in that cloud, kind of covering up his glory from the people. And this hill on Golgotha, guys, it sounds a lot like Sinai. Because again, the sky turns dark, it gets stormy, and the earth again shakes. As the king is given a crown of thorns, And as he is lifted up in the space between heaven and earth on a cross. This is our go-between. This is our forever mediator between us and a holy God. He is the bridge that we would draw near to God. That we would fix our eyes on God's holiness and understanding that there is no way outside of Christ, that we could come close to him. Jesus was the true and better Moses. As he became the mediator that we needed, as Moses spoke to God for the people, Jesus cried out to God from the cross for his people. Do you guys see what this is in this scene? It's another creation story. This is where we become new creations. Because of this hilltop experience, we get to say, the old is gone, the new has come. This is where Jesus initiated the new covenant, succeeding where the Mosaic, the old covenant, failed. That covenant was impossible. The people could not obey it, and we cannot obey it. But the new covenant comes, and it is carried by Jesus. He held the law. He obeyed where we cannot. He became the perfect priest, the perfect son, the perfect king. And guys, this is where we think, well, that's got to be as good as it gets. That is such good news. 
But see, after he died and resurrected, and the, the church, the first church was formed, there's even gooder news. When we identify with Christ, when we identify in his death and in his resurrection, we actually are told so often by Paul that we can live in union with him, union with Christ. And what that means then is that Jesus' righteousness is imputed on us. It's that all the ways that Jesus obeyed, I now get to be seen as if I obeyed. So that identity that we talked about at the beginning, that seems so impossible how am I ever going to actually act like I am owned by God, possessed by God? How can I be a priest? How can I be holy? And the answer is because of Jesus. Because if I am clinging onto him as he clings onto me, then that identity is just spoken over me. And we saw it in 1 Peter chapter 2 this week. Spoken to a mixed room of Jews and Gentiles. Spoken to us as well. Ladies, that is who we are. We are those things. It's not set out like a goal that we have to work really, really hard out on our own. No, our invitation is to be unified with Christ and lean in to the identity that he's given us. Doesn't mean we don't have effort, but we understand that we can't earn that identity. So that's who we are if we're in Christ. So let's respond to it, that we've been gifted that by living it out. Let's not try and carry everything, hold all things together. That's God's job. Let's not try and be the ruler this week, but let's be servants, royal servants. And let's be holy. Let's say no to sin. Let's starve our sin and turn towards righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us enough to deliver us and loving us enough to reveal yourself to us. Lord, I pray that whatever uh, the women in this room are wrestling with or going through or grieving over or confused about, Lord, I pray that we would all hear your invitation to draw near to the throne of grace where we can help find help in our time of need. We give you the glory and the praise, King Jesus. Amen.